If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com backslash FPA. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. If you would like to earn continuing education credit for your FP&A certification from the Association of Finance Professionals for listening to the show, go to the show notes for details on how to earn the credit. Finally, if you enjoy listening to FP&A today, please go to your podcast platform of choice, click the subscribe button, and leave a rating and review of the show. And now, on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FP&A Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FP&A Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FP&A Guy. FP&A Today is brought to you by Data Rails, the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Amy Omond. Amy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. Yeah, we're really excited to to have you here with us. So a little bit about Amy. Amy comes to us from Oakland, California. She earned her bachelor's in accounting from Georgetown and her MBA from Berkeley. She has her CPA license and has been running her own business, Seven Seat Consulting, supporting nonprofits for the last year. And so we're really excited to have her here. And we're going to start with a fun question we like to ask everybody. We start off the show with these days. What was the most challenging or most difficult budgeting experience you've ever had? Yes, you are certainly starting with the hard-hitting questions, those <laughs> tough times that uh, we have had with budgeting. Um, I, the thing that popped into my head was actually um, from the past when I was working at a for-profit company at Dryer's Ice Cream. Um, there was a period of time that I was involved in the capital steering committee where I was helping to pull together the financial analysis for any new ice cream line. Um, And I still remember the marketing folks coming to me and saying, what ROI do I need to get my project approved? Um, So all of that was sort of indicative of folks, you know, sort of starting at the end point um, and thinking that they could backwards map, you know, the financial analysis needed um, in order to get their their project approved, um, so you know it was it was interesting to navigate those those times and sort of put together a true financial analysis when um, you recognize that everyone sort of had their own their own needs, um, you know, in the budgeting process. Yeah, it reminds me of the time when someone asked me, "What do you want the accrual to be?" <laughs> Right, right. You know, I was like, I want it to be what it's a realistic estimate of what we think is going to happen that we can support. And what they were mm-hmm. asking me is, how much do we need to bring in to hit our budget? Because we want to save the rest for next year. Right. You know, that was right. the implied question. Kind of like, okay, just tell me what ROI I need to get to and I'll engineer a case that I get there. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's, you know, it's it's difficult when people want to start at the end rather than, you know, the beginning kind of, I'm a, I'm a true believer in bottoms up budgeting, zero based budgeting sort of, you know, yes, you, you do have to know where you need to be, but you got to build up the assumptions, you know, from the detail, from the ground up to, to actually have it be a valid analysis and, you know, um, get the business going in, in the right direction. Yeah. Agree. Anytime you start with, okay, we got to get 12% and you put together the case to, get to 12 and a half, whether it makes sense or not, you just get yourself in trouble. I know I've seen it more than once. So what was the key takeaway from that experience? What was the learning? Yeah, well, uh, you know, that the learning about kind of doing the bottoms up budgeting, you know, kind of always needing to, to, uh, uh, to start from, you know, the true assumptions, but also just kind of the people aspect of budgeting is is always there, you know. In this case, the the marketing folks, you know, they had their grand ideas to the new packaging or the new ice cream line. So they really wanted that to happen. The engineers, you know, wanted the most amount of money they could spend on their new, you know, um, um, production line and, and all of that. So the management of, of people's expectations um, is... It's really salient in any any budgeting exercise, and sometimes those of us I know I am an introvert, love to be you know in my spreadsheets, sort of performing the analysis. But you also have to be out there with people and kind of understanding their 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 needs and wants, and 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 navigate within that context. 
I like how you said navigate because there's definitely a lot of navigation because almost always the needs or the wants are much bigger than the dollars, right? right? They may say it's needs and then you have that, okay, what's really a need and what can we afford? So it's a lot of back and forth for sure. Definitely. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and just your background, how you ended up where you're at today? Yeah, well, I um, I feel like numbers and accounting have kind of always been in my, my blood, my background. My, my grandfather was actually an accountant for his municipal, um, uh, energy company in, in Missouri, uh, a long time ago in the 1920s. Um, my dad was a small businessman. So I, I just sort of, you know, felt like business and accounting and finance, um, you know, always kind of came naturally to me, uh, when I was in undergrad and a several years ago now, um, got into the accounting program there and, and really loved, loved my time learning about Gap and um, sort of the rules of the road and, and ended up at PricewaterhouseCoopers for a few years while I got my CPA. Um, I spent about 10 years in for-profit companies um, and, uh, and then pivoted into uh, nonprofits and social enterprise for the, the second um, half of my career, uh, most recently in uh, organizations that are supporting K-12 education, which has really been meaningful to me to kind of take my financial analysis um, into the world of, of education, um, public education, improving outcomes for students, um, especially as I have two children who are now 17 and 13. I've, I've been navigating them through Oakland Public Schools, so it's been really um, helpful for me to work with experts in the field uh, that know a lot about education. Yeah, I, I could totally see that where that would be helpful. And that's definitely an area where, you know, we need to continue to improve. There's plenty of room for uh, improvement, at least from my perspective of what I see having a daughter in, you know, in, in K through 12 as well. So I can understand that. So, you know, as you mentioned, as you spent kind of the first 10 years working for large corporations and then made the move to nonprofit, what motivated that switch? What made you decide to go from profit to nonprofit? Yeah, the 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 pivot point, if you will, was was my time at um, Berkeley when I was getting my MBA. I was in the evening and weekend program there while I was working at Dryer's Ice Cream, um, who was was acquired by Nestle during my tenure there. And um, I took a class called the Social Responsibility of Business, taught by Kelly McElhaney, and I was just really inspired by that course. I actually did my project on dryers. Um, and presented to the CEO at the time, you know, did, did some work around um, our environmental impact, um, you know, how we treat employees, uh, um, as well as, um, you know, focused on profits and, and the bottom line. So it was a really eye-opening experience um, to kind of go through that process and realize that even for-profit organizations can, um, you know, kind of have this multi-stakeholder approach. I knew at the time while I was getting my MBA, I was like, should I pivot into, you know, more ESG reporting, kind of get out of the day-to-day finance. But at the end of the day, I kind of realized organizations of all shapes and sizes need folks like me, you know, with the skill set and the CPA that I that I bring. So I decided to stay, you know, in my my functional area of finance and just focus on um, working for organizations that mean something to me, um, you know, that, that, that kind of have that, that social aspect. So after I left Dryers, I worked for an organization called Revolution Foods, which is a healthy school lunch company. I was their first finance hire. So it was mm-hmm. really fun to take everything I learned from um, food manufacturing and CPG um, and bring it to startup organization um, that was providing healthy school lunches, primarily to Title I schools, um, schools that, that are supporting uh, low-income kids mm-hmm. in, across the nation. And we, we scaled from California all the way across the country um, during my time there. And so that was, was really meaningful. Um, after that experience, I pivoted into nonprofits. And um, I was very lucky to find very strategic nonprofits to, uh, to work for. I spent the last eight years at New Schools Venture Fund, um, so New Schools was actually an initial investor in Revolution Foods. So that's where I first heard of them. New Schools is a venture philanthropy. So we would give grants to education organizations and new start- startup schools across the country. They were actually founded in the late 90s by venture capitalists from Kleiner Perkins who had, you know, the big vision of what if 
uh, we could fund an organization that uh, could seed innovation within K-12 uh, education across the country, similar to how in, in the late 90s, the dot-com boom was going on. And, you know, one of Kleiner Perkins' early investments was in a little company called Google. Um, so, so the idea was how can we um, seed innovation in K-12 education? Uh, so I spent eight years there um, as their CFO uh, and finance person sort of helping to um, uh, distribute money and learn from these education entrepreneurs that were really bringing, um, you know, amazing innovation across across the country. Thank you for sharing your story, and I love how you brought that together. You know, the love of the social side with your passion for finance, and went you know non not for profit. I've always been a big fan of companies that have that social responsibility. I you know one of the companies I follow a lot is uh, Corp. B companies, right? Which aren't yes. quite not for profit, but they kind of sit a little bit in between in the sense that they have a mission beyond just bottom line. Right. And so there's one here locally that I just love, and I've had their FPA person on before called Cotopaxi. And I, I've got to know the CEO a little bit and yeah. love to see the way they're trying to alleviate poverty. So I just I think it's great to see whether it's not for profit, whether it's for profit, but just doing more to benefit society, that multi-stakeholder approach. Yes, yes, definitely. You know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders. Multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop. Breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex, consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow. FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up-to-date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean fp a machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So I think, I think that's great. So today you run your own fractional CFO business supporting nonprofits. How did you decide to start your own business? How did that come about? Yeah, well, I decided to, after eight years at New Schools Venture Fund, um, I left in early 2023. Um, New Schools really gave me the opportunity to um, work with early stage entrepreneurs. Um, so because we were giving seed funding to um, early stage nonprofits, mm -hmm. uh, as well as some for-profit organizations, um, had the opportunity to uh, work with some of those entrepreneurs on some key questions they had about financial infrastructure, sort of what they needed um, um, as they were getting their organizations uh, up and running. Because not only would new schools provide um, money in the form of grants and investments, we would provide what we called management assistance, which was basically um, expertise on our staff or other consultants, you know, sort of working with those organizations to, to support them as they grew. So that was really where I saw the need for um, uh, organizations to have expertise such as mine, but not on a on a full time basis. You know, early stage budgets, um, you know, can't handle full time uh, CFO level support. Uh, so, so I um, I decided to launch a fractional CFO uh, uh, organization, Seven Seat Consulting, where I have five clients right now, um, and I'm helping them as they are going from early stage to mid stage and helping to shape up their financials, get the right infrastructure in place, the right internal controls, maybe get them through their first audit, um, work on best practices for budgeting and forecasting, what they need from a funder reporting um, standpoint. So it, um, I, you know, I saw the need in the marketplace. And the, the other aspect was sort of my own personal needs. Um, I, as, as I mentioned, just love finance so much. Um, and even at New Schools, which is a you know pretty sizable organization, 
as CFO, I was in charge of technology and sometimes HR and uh, <laughs> sort of other aspects of administration that I was like, you know, I would love to really just focus on, on finance. So the fractional CFO model really meets my own needs where I can roll up my sleeves a bit more, support my clients. I'm seeing a bunch of new and different business models, which is really exciting for me. Um, and then they get the benefit of sort of my expertise on that, that fractional basis. Yeah, it sounds like it's a perfect fit for you and you're really enjoying it. So that's great. So so I'm curious, right? You've spent a fair amount of time in not-for-profit, fair amount of time in the for-profit sector. What are some of the biggest similarity and differences between the two when it comes to finance? Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, I would, would love to talk about um, both similarities and differences. Um <laughs> And I love the fact that you mentioned, you know, a lot of people say nonprofit and they think no profit, but you you articulated it is not for profit, which really means that nonprofits um, just don't have profit as their as their you know primary driver. Um, it's a tax designation that basically the IRS says if you are a not for profit, then that means your profits don't have to be taxed, which is lovely for those of us in this space. Um, but it certainly does not mean that you are not making any profit, um, because otherwise we wouldn't be sustainable. Um, you know, we have different gap terminology for that, adding to our net assets, um, for example. But, um, one of the myths I'd love to, to just dispel is that nonprofits are, are, are not strategic. They're sort of not forward thinking that we're always, you know, sort of scrapping for for change and you know just trying to get things done i've had the the honor of working alongside and with organizations that are very strategically focused and um you know they uh we're working within systems that can allow us to do um you know new and, and different things and really focus on on our mission in a nonprofit context um in a in a very strategic way. So um, the the ways in which they're they're different. Um, one of the primary ways um, uh, that they're different is in uh, revenue recognition areas um, and primarily philanthropic revenue. So this is one thing in in forecasting and budgeting that uh, we can sometimes struggle with. Um, not all nonprofits have philanthropic revenue, many of them do um, because of the tax benefits to donors. Um, it can be really hard to budget and forecast for philanthropy if an organization is supported on a, on a large part by philanthropic um, revenue in addition or, or uh, solely by philanthropic revenue rather than earned income. Um, Everyone sort of manages pipelines of philanthropy and you have, you know, weighted averages of what you think, you know, you're going to bring in and, and recognize as any year. But if one grant comes in, you know, it's, it's either going to be zero or 500,000, for example. So it can be kind of hard to budget in that context um, when uncertainty can creep in and you're just not sure, uh, you know, it's not like earned income where you can base it off of his historicals and, you know, think about revenue run rates and, and things of that sort. The other aspect of philanthropy are restrictions. Um, many philanthropies like to place restrictions on how their money is spent. Um, there's a big conversation in the nonprofit finance world about, um, about this in particular and, and hopefully a movement toward um, less restrictions um, that funders are, are, are putting on their money. Um, many funders only want to see their money spent on program and not on things like overhead and um, operations and finance and accounting and things of that sort. The um, ironic thing is those restrictions actually cost more because we have to track them um, in a very detailed way from a financial standpoint. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the hope is there's, there's a, a term out there called trust-based philanthropy um, where we are um, hoping that more philanthropic funders are going to adopt this approach where they're giving unrestricted funds. Um, Mackenzie Scott um, has been a, 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 a great uh, trust-based philanthropist the last few years. She's actually given $14 billion to 1,600 nonprofits in the last few years, and she does it in a very... Um, open-ended, uh, unrestricted way, um, which, which has been a game changer for, for many nonprofits. 
The last thing that I'll mention just as far as differences is, is sort of the culture uh, within nonprofits um, that, that I have found is very collaborative. I know in for-profits, especially within finance and dealing with numbers, you need to be, um, you know, you, you need to hold that information confidentially because of um, all sorts of different reasons. And in nonprofits, we publish our financial statements, our Form 990s uh, uh, publicly, um, you know, want to share our information publicly as well as, you know, we can kind of share uh, across um, organizations what's working and, and um uh, share things like our salaries and, and things of that sort um, on a more collaborative basis. So um, so that's another another difference that I've seen. I really like that last one, the collaborative. It's nice that you can just be open and talk about things. We've all been there in finance roles where restructuring or whatever it might be where you can't talk about anything. And it can it can be a challenge sometimes when you can't share certain things. That's nice. You have more opportunity to be open. And I totally agree with you about the uh, restrictions, having talked to some people and knowing a little bit about that, having worked for the government, contracting is where I started my career, right? What color of money was it is what we'd call it. So what appropriation did it come from? What bill, what could it be used for? What couldn't it be used for? And having Mm -hmm. to track all that just puts a lot of rules in the reporting side. I mean, obviously a little different than a not-for-profit, but similar type of thing in that it makes it very complex. So I can relate to that a little bit. And it was really tough to be like, all right, this money can be used this way, but can it be used that way? And asking those type of questions. Yeah, yeah. And and I know uh, uh, organizations I've worked with that have received government funding um, have to, you know, track in that way. I mean, I can understand both sides of the coin. Like, obviously, as a citizen, I want to make sure any government funding sort of gets spent um, uh, Mm -hmm. according to what it's it's intended to. But but the amount of restrictions and sort of red tape. um, I mean, I have also worked with organizations who have said I'm not going to accept any government funding because of the additional, you know, 10 to 15 percent of costs it's going to take just to manage this grant. And, um, you know, uh, uh, that's a, a, a valid response as well. Well, it's just like the cost to go public, right? You got to manage all those rules, similar type of thing. There can be a lot, a lot of regulation and rules to go with that. So I, I could see why they choose to do that. So, you know, kind of shifting gears a little bit, can you talk about the typical budgeting process for a nonprofit? What is, what is that like? Maybe, or maybe some ways where it's similar and different, but just talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think it is more similar than than different. You know, a lot of it is um, uh, setting out the plan for the budget. You know, making sure um, you can kind of backwards map from whenever you need your your end um, budget to be approved. Um, making sure that you've got uh, uh, the tools set up you know, appropriately kind of digging into last year's actuals, getting your, your budget model set up, um, meeting with all of the key stakeholders, um, within the organization, whether it's just, you know, the CEO, or if it's a larger organization, sort of the heads of different departments and, um, setting the budgets up so that they can, um, uh, input, you know, their, their wishes, dreams, and plans for, for, uh, the the future year into the budget model. Um, I would generally then work on consolidating all of that information, you know, taking it to um, higher management. And then we look at things from that 50,000 foot view. How does this budget, you know, bottoms up budget match to our expectations? What does, uh, what's the impact on our reserves? Um, what is the, um, likelihood of, if it's philanthropically revenue driven, sort of what's the likelihood of, of, um, you know, changes in revenue coming in. Um, So we might need to go back to those budget owners and make some recommendations to decrease expenses. Um, But then ultimately you're packaging it together for uh, the ultimate approval, which is the nonprofit governance board um, at the end of the year. They'll meet um, look at the budget, ask their key strategic questions, you know, from their governance standpoint um, to make sure that we as management have kicked all the tires and, um, you know, and are, are uh, 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 happy with the, the way that our financial performance is, is laid out and then um, approve the budget from there. 
as we go through the year, of course, budget to actual reporting is very key. Um, and, you know, there may be times that we have to go back to the board um, if we need to make a budget adjustment. Um, so maybe we've gotten a new grant that we didn't anticipate. And so that means we're going to increase our expenses. Um, so, so sort of take them that real-time information as we go through the year um, to adjust the budgets. Does that tend to be the biggest thing that causes budget adjustments is some kind of unexpected revenue, either shortfall or addition? It's probably not on the expense side, but I'm guessing it's on a, a grant that comes through you didn't expect or big grant that dries up earlier than you planned or whatever it might be. Is those usually the kind of the big adjustments yes. that have to happen? Yes, yes, exactly. And and I know I, I always have a philosophy of um, because of the revenue uncertainty, we budget conservatively because it always feels better for the budget adjustment to be, hey, we exceeded <laughs> our revenue. And so therefore we can spend more money rather than the other way around of, oh, we thought, you know, we were going to bring in this much and it's coming in lower. So we have to cut. Um so, so that's, uh, that's always been a, um, a key underpinning of, of, of how I like to budget. Yeah, I'm with you. Upside is always better than downside. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, what are the key metrics you look at not for profit? Like maybe take New, new Schools Venture Fund or, you know, just in general, since you've been a CFO, what are some of those key metrics that you like to look at? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, at New Schools, um, we follow the um, uh, OKR uh, ways of of, mm -hmm. of budgeting, or, or sorry, goal setting, um, objective and key results. Um, so our three uh, main OKRs. The first one was fundraising. So you know, we knew that we weren't going to meet our mission if we didn't fundraise um, the way that we needed to. Um, the next two were not so much financial related, but I'll mention them. Venture satisfaction. We wanted to make sure all of our grantees that were um, obtaining our funding were, were happy with our support and our grant process um, in giving unrestricted funding, that they, they did not find it as an onerous process. Uh, and then employee satisfaction. So we would, we would track um, the NPS of our, our employees. Getting back into more of the financial metrics, though, um, you know, in addition to those kind of top three uh, OKRs, um, many of our financial discussions the last few years were on our reserve levels, um, and it was it was interesting because uh, going back to kind of that conservative budgeting that we were talking about and always exceeding our revenue goals, we actually had several years of of exceeding our revenue goals, um, and that led to our reserves growing. Mm -hmm. which is great for an organization, but with an organization with a mission of seeding, you know, and funding uh, 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 organizations in K-12 education, we, we did not want, you know, our bank balances to get so high, you know, we wanted uh, the impact um, that we were looking for in, in the education space. So, so often our finance committee, we would talk about, okay, this is our, you know, our, our base level of reserve and let's make sure that we're spending mm -hmm. um, and, and, and not just saving this cash, you know, for a rainy day, but kind of find that right Goldilocks level, um, if you will, of, of reserve level. And then the last thing I'll mention that, you know, every nonprofit should track, even with, with high reserves or just cash flow. Um, uh, that's not so much at new schools, but more with my startup clients now, um, you know, Cash is king. That's true. For profit, nonprofit, everywhere. You got to make sure you know you have a, a good handle on um, your cash balances, the money coming in. Um, even at new schools, we would find um, you know there would be a, a, a dip in expenditures because we would give grants in the June timeframe, and many of our um, incoming funds would come in the December timeframe. Um, even, you know, donors still like to wait until December <laughs> to, to, uh, to, to give, you know, well, based off of what their tax planners are I was are just going to say, so. they want to look at and go, okay, if I give this much, I get this much of a break. They can figure exactly, it out at the end of the year. Exactly. So, you know, you, if you're only looking at your December 31 balances and saying, oh, everything's fine, you know, you, you still need to look at, um, how your cash is trending throughout the year. Uh, and make sure that, uh, you know, that there's no hot spots anywhere um, in any place that you might need to get a line of credit, for example, or, um, you know, uh, investigate other other means of cash flow. Yeah, as you said, uh, cash cash is king or queen. I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't have cash, it doesn't matter what the rest of the statements say. 
Exactly. Exactly. I'm curious. Let's say we have an FP&A person. You know, they spent most of their career in for profit. They're looking to support, you know, not for profit. They'd like to make that switch to a nonprofit. What's the uh, skill sets that they might need to develop? Are there areas that are different that they need to be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, you know, all nonprofits need the 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 skill sets that FPNA professionals have. Kind of being analytic, being being rational, being methodical. You know, being able to to put together an analysis. Um, you know, see what what the results of that analysis is. Um, but kind of what we were talking about at the beginning of of the episode. Kind of understanding the human nature aspect of of money um, is is a skill set that. Um, uh, is is definitely present in nonprofits, and that FPNA professionals should um, should have. You know, when you are um, working with someone on their budget um, in a mission driven organization, you're generally working with um, you know someone on the the program team, if you will, someone that's that's. Uh, I'll use New School as an example. They were previously um, high school principals, for example, or you know working within a school district. So they have a very different. Um, way of thinking about um, um, money and, and budgeting. And sure. so so recognizing kind of where people are um, and their understanding of, um, you know, the whole budgeting process and uh, making sure that you're supporting them is is a, a key to being successful um, running budgets in, um, in nonprofits. You know, it's also really helpful if, uh, if you yourself are bought in on the mission you know, I've always sought out organizations that are that are doing things that are also personally meaningful to me, um, because then I feel so much more engaged in the success of the organization, and you know, want to make sure that um, the, you know the numbers that I'm putting together are, are are really contributing to the success of of the mission of the organization. I think that's great advice. Whether you're part of a for profit or not for profit is. Right. You really do want to buy into where you're working, you want right. to believe in what they're doing. It makes it easier to get up and go to work. But I think especially so in a not for profit, if you're supporting something you don't really believe in and they have this cause, I think you know, that would create even greater challenges than necessarily in a for profit, just because of the nature and often the passion you see in those type of organizations. Right. Right. Definitely. That makes a lot of sense. So as you know, this uh, episode came about, someone had reached out to me asking, saying, hey, have you had anyone on that's not for profit? And I was like, I haven't. They're like, can you? You know, it sounded like they're kind of struggling with, you know, I think a little bit of budgeting and forecasting and just providing good FP&A support for, for their company. So any advice you would offer to somebody out there that might be in that situation, you know, not for profit and just struggling a little bit with, how to you know how to manage FP&A for their organization? Again, a lot of it I think it could happen in a for-profit um, as well as a, as a nonprofit. Um, uh, the the uh, staying organized and really trying to focus on um, a mantra I've used for for many years called one version of the truth. Um, <laughs> I feel like this happens in a lot of organizations. Just the proliferation of spreadsheets. There's a spreadsheet for this, a spreadsheet for that. You know, 18 different spreadsheets to track revenue. Um, so, so that organization and lens that an FP&A person brings of of trying to make sure that there is one version of the truth and not 18 different versions of the truth um, in, in kind of bringing their their analysis together um, is is something that I um, certainly subscribe to and work with many of my clients on sort of making sure there's a system, you know, a CRM system for tracking donors or earned income. There's, um, you know, the solid information coming out of their um, HRIS systems and um, in tracking, you know, new employees and, and things of that sort. So, so that's, that's really key. I mean, I'll also point back to just the, the technical nature, kind of what we were discussing before about, about revenue recognition and, and restrictions, you know, that is, is a key difference, um, that, you know, taking a class on that, taking a, um, a seminar just on, on restricted revenue, kind of how to track, how to track grants, um, in that detailed way when, when a funder does require it, um, would be um, a good thing for someone that's not as familiar with nonprofits to kind of brush up on before 
um, before jumping in and, and, you know, working at a nonprofit, for example. Got it. So if I'm hearing you right, a couple of things that came to mind for me is one, like you said, just the importance of understanding the restrictions on money. You know, if you mm-hmm. don't know anything about them, take a seminar, do some research, take a class, whatever, but bring yourself up to speed. And the second, I really liked how you called it one version of the truth focusing on the systems and the data so that you can tell a good story. So you can understand what your numbers are and everybody can be on the same page. Cause we've all, I'm almost positive. Everybody listening has worked for that company or multiple companies where it's a mess and you get into a meeting and well, I have this number and I have this number and it's like, all right, well, this meeting isn't going to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I will say, I mean, I know many of us, use Excel, we default to Excel, you know, for as our as our main budgeting tool. I have definitely been in that boat um, because of its flexibility and, you know, all of the great things that Excel brings. But um, just the proliferation of spreadsheets is can be can be dangerous and confusing and everyone sort of has a different idea of what's going on. So um, you know, many nonprofits kind of going back to um, organizations that try and keep overhead down one of the last systems that actually gets implemented is like a true budgeting and forecasting software. So, you know, I've been looking into those, but it's, it's hard to justify, you know, uh, when you absolutely have to have a general ledger and you have to, you know, uh, um, the next system that generally gets rolled out is the CRM, you know, to make sure that you're tracking um, incoming funds. So, so from that system standpoint, um, it's it's not one that gets prioritized, so that means that there's more more kind of danger in the in the forecasting and, and budgeting space um, of of everyone kind of having their own um, spreadsheet going on. Sure, yeah, that can definitely uh, be a challenge. We've all been there with the proliferation of spreadsheets, so I can see that. And yeah, you got limited funds, and when do you invest in it? Right? Yeah, exactly. So you know. This is kind of changing subjects a little bit, but on your website, I noticed that you called yourself, I believe it was, you know, you described yourself as a numbers nerd. Why is that? What is it that you love yes. about numbers? Where's that passion come from? Yeah, yeah, yes. Numbers nerd, a, a, a badge I wear proudly. Um, <laughs> I do I, as well, so I get it. <laughs> I, I I mean, I feel like even back in, in grade school and, um, uh, uh, high school, I just loved math. Um, you know, and, and it was because there was a right answer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the clarity in, in having, having a right answer, um, that I could get to, I could figure out, um, I, I loved, of course, as I've gotten older and more mature, the complexity of the world and the universe, you know, has, has creeped in. So I know that sometimes you don't, uh, have the clarity of, of the right answer, they still provide, however, the comfort, you know, when you can go in and do an analysis, um, you know, see what, what, what the past, um, uh, is telling you, um, you know, you, you can, you can roll up that analysis. It's, uh, um, the, the clarity in that, um, is comforting, um, where, where I have had to unwind, you know, some, some of those aspects of, of my youth and always kind of driving toward the right answer is also recognizing the complexity and, um, especially when you start to think about forward looking all the different scenarios that could could play out um uh it is not as simple as you know completing a a, a math equation and and coming out with you know what is the truth um so so I've had to integrate that more as i've as I've matured um <laughs> but uh but numbers do still give me a lot of comfort and and joy um in in being able to to organize and analyze information. Love it. And yes, when you're little, there's always that right answer. And kind of funny story on that is I had an accountant that I really enjoyed working with and I needed a financial analyst. And I asked him if he was interested. Uh, no, no, no. He goes, that's just all funny math. He's like, you're just making numbers up and seeing if they're right. He's like, I like knowing what the answer is. Like, I'll stay as an accountant. I'm good. And I just kind of <laughs> laugh because he just loved the fact that you could tie it out and everything would balance. And he just didn't want to deal with all that ambiguity, uncertainty. It just didn't fit his personality. So I just said that it kind of made me think a little bit of what he told me that. Cause I was like, all right, well, that makes sense. Well, then you stay where you're at. Cause I like the job you do. You yes. Know, so. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good for people to recognize that. I know, I know the differences. I certainly love it when I'm in the actuals and I'm tying things out or, you know, I can get close and then I use my favorite word. It's immaterial, you know, <laughs> immaterial difference. I don't have to figure out what that last, you know, $25 is. Um, yes. But, uh, but yeah, then thinking about forward looking and, uh, you know, all of the different scenarios that can play out. I mean, one of the things I'll also say is like the minute that you get a budget approved, it's out of date because, you know, life is happening and, Mm -hmm. you know, something different is going to happen. That's going to cause your budget to, uh, to be wrong and that's okay. (laughs) Yep. It's like a famous, uh. George Bach said, it's not about budgets, but it would apply. He said, all models are wrong. Some are useful. Yeah, right. I love that. Same Mm -hmm. is true for budgets. I haven't found a budget yet that's that's right. Yeah. If you produce a budget to actuals with zero variance, you have done something wrong. Or (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So as you look back over your career, what's the accomplishment you're most proud of and why? Yeah. Well, I was excited that you mentioned it earlier in the podcast, um, B corporations. So as I was thinking about my career, um, uh, one of the things I am most proud of is taking Revolution Foods, the the healthy school lunch company through their first B corporation certification. So it is it like you, I follow B Corps um, often. Now when I'm thinking about, you know, who I want to bank with or, you know, different things I'm going to buy or, you know, vendors I'm recommending to, um, to my nonprofits for using, um, I look at, um, if, if they're a certified B Corp, just because the, the work that they do to make sure that organizations are, you know, not only for-profit organizations, they're not only focused on profit, but also focused on sort of this multi-stakeholder view, paying employees a living wage, um, having a, you know, smaller environmental footprint, um, things of that sort. It's, um, uh, I was, I was very proud to be on the front lines of that for, for Revolution Foods, um, about, uh, 12 years ago now. Um, and I've loved seeing the world of B Corps, uh, grow. That's awesome. And before I started my own business, that's really where I wanted to work. I didn't get the opportunity. I'd applied for some jobs with the B Corp and just always really appreciated what they do. So I think that's awesome. You got that opportunity to go through that process. Any maybe key takeaways from that, like from the process that you could tell us about? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it was definitely, um, uh, I mean, a key takeaway, it was not easy, it, nor should it be, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it was it was very detailed. And I think even since then, because I believe Revolution Foods was definitely on the early side of the B Corp movement, um, I believe it's gotten more... Um, more rigorous and they, uh, they have you, I can't remember if it's annual or, or every few years, you know, sort of continue to, to report up. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it sort of served as a, as a great third party template for us to use as to how the organization wanted to grow and scale and manage its business, you know, um, going forward. So, so, so that was great to kind of have that, that external resource, and template to say this is this is kind of best practice. So I would encourage you know if anyone's interested to to at least look at their metrics, and then that can kind of serve as um, you know as a way for you to 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 organize your um, your reporting and and um, uh, ideals around uh, engaging various stakeholders with your your organization um, going forward. Well, fun. Thank you for for sharing that. So we're coming near the end of our time. So we have this section called the get to know you section. So you get no more than 30 seconds for each answer. We have uh, four questions we'll ask you here. So the first one is what is something interesting, something we wouldn't find online that not many people know about you? Yeah, yeah, this is a a fun one. So I was uh, thinking about this just last week. I was prepping a budget for a new client of mine and not many people know that when I'm doing kind of deep budgeting work, focused work, I have to have rock music playing in particular Metallica seems to really work for me. So I love all kinds of music, but it has to be, you know, 
something that it just it really gets gets my blood going when I'm when I'm when I'm doing modeling and kind of you know setting up um, um, someone's forecast tool. Uh, Metallica's albums really really seem to work well for me. Not gonna lie, I wouldn't have guessed that. So that's yeah, a good one. I, yeah. I, I don't see you as someone rock, rocking out to Metallica, but I like it. That's fun. I, I'm a you know Gen Xer '90s, so uh, you know music uh, fan. So so yeah, that in particular works for me. It was funny because I was done with my modeling and I turned it off. I switched to another task, and then I was like, oh, I can't listen to Metallica anymore. I have to switch gears to something <laughs> a little lighter because it's it only. Uh, comes up when I'm when I'm kind of deep into forecasting and budgeting. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, I'm I'm a child of the '90s as well, so I I know the music <laughs> well that era. So that's fun. So if you could meet one person in the world, dead or alive, who would you meet and why? Yeah, I so I have fallen down the ancestry.com hole several times <laughs> where. <laughs> um, I have been trying to piece together, you know, aspects of my history and sort of haven't gone beyond great grandparents, unfortunately. So if I had the opportunity to meet anyone, I would love to meet uh, uh, a relative of mine that I descended from that made the decision to leave. Um, you know, I believe my roots are in UK, um, Scotland area. So mm -hmm. leave and, and come to the new world. Um, I've been focused on kind of trying to get far as far back um, in my ancestry history. Um, so, so if I had that magical opportunity, that's who I would want to meet. That'd be a great one. And yeah, I've done a fair amount. I don't, haven't done much recently, but family history, my wife's done a lot as well. And it's fascinating to learn about your history and where you came from. And yeah, it'd be a great conversation. Love to have dinner with a bunch of the relatives around the table and just hear their stories and what it was Definitely. like when they were alive. You, you gain a greater appreciation for yourself. There was a study that said it was really interesting. I can't remember the exact details. I'd have to go find it. But the point was those families that do the best and stay together, tell stories of their family history. Yeah, They're some of the yeah. most well-adjusted families. They did a deep study on it. It was really interesting. That was one of the uh, biggest predictors they found. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a great one. So mm -hmm. next one here, what is the last thing you Googled, looked up on YouTube, or we added this, asked a generative AI, bar, chat, GPT, whatever, about finance, FP&A, or Excel? Yeah, yes. So I I did use chat GPT um, to, uh, the last thing I asked chat GPT uh, relating to, to work was to help lay out um, the pros and cons of outsourcing your finance and accounting versus keeping it in-house. Um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot, especially if I, I, I have clients that are kind of in this growth mode of like, what are the the markers, you know, to think about um, outsourcing with someone like me or building an, an in-house team. Um, so I think both have benefits and, and drawbacks. Um, and, and it's interesting because my model, I know that I'm eventually going to have clients that are going to outgrow me and, and I'm going to sure. help support them, you know, in, mm -hmm. in helping to build an in-house finance team or, you know, um, help them hire the, the right folks. Um, so that was what I thought maybe AI would have some, some good insights to be able to synthesize for me. And how did it do? Uh, it was, it was so high level. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's often the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were lots of bullet points, like two pages. And I was like, okay, <laughs> this is all pretty like, at the end of the day, it was like outsource if you want to, or keep them in house if you want to. <laughs> I was like, all right, this is not, not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, sometimes I've had a few like that as well. I could relate. Mm -hmm. So this is probably one of my favorite questions to ask. We've asked this since the very beginning. I think it's the only one we've asked pretty much every episode. Favorite thing about Excel, function or feature? Yeah. So I, I'm going to go historical on this one too. I don't know. It's embarrassing to admit that like, I still remember this moment, which was over 20 years ago when I deconstructed the VLOOKUP. Um, <laughs> I knew function. you were going to go VLOOKUP because anyone who goes historic, it's VLOOKUP. <laughs> well, it was transformative. I mean, it took something that was taking me an hour to do. And all of a sudden I can do it in five minutes. I taught everybody. This was when I was a 
a general ledger accountant at dryers. I still remember, you know, <laughs> figuring out what, what, you know, what each input meant and like how, how to use it. So, so that it, it, it remains a, a favorite of mine. Um, even though I don't use it as much anymore, but. <laughs> well, you're in good company. I think it is the uh, number one most mentioned formula on the show. So. Oh, good. good. There you good. go. Yeah. I like going with the majority. <laughs> it works. So we just mm-hmm. have two questions left for you. So the first is, if you could offer some advice to someone starting a career in FP&A today, what would that advice be? Yeah. If you are starting starting your career now, I would say, you know, uh, follow your passion. Um, you know, just if, if you know that, you know, analyzing numbers or kind of staying, you know, staying in the historical, as we were talking about earlier, um, is, is comfortable for you, then do that. Many organizations need excellent accountants. Um, if you love the scenario planning and future forecasting, you know, focus, focus on that. Um, find a great mentor. I have definitely benefited from many of the mentors I've had at every organization I've worked for, um, you know, as well as the, um, educational institutions I've, I've had the, the honor of, um, uh, of, of being proximate to, um, and, and I'll say to, to your, you know, listeners that maybe don't have much, um, uh, insight into nonprofits. Uh, if you're at a stage in your career where you can give back a little volunteer time, a great way to do that is joining a nonprofit board. Um, they are volunteer positions. They always need finance people. So even if you don't know that much about nonprofit finance, um, you can join a board. It's a relatively low lift. You attend, you know, quarterly meetings. You might join a a finance committee and learn from the executive director, the CEO, you know, a bit more about how their business works. And it's a great way to kind of step your toe into the nonprofit world of something that you care about, find a local organization, um, you know, that's, that's meaningful to you. Um, uh, if it's a animal shelter, for example, or a school or, you know, um, uh, anything that's, that's, you know, giving back to your community, you can, you can help bring your FP&A brain to the table um, and provide a lot of value for that nonprofit. Great. So I like that. I love the, uh, you know, follow your passion and then joining a board or working for a, a nonprofit is a great way to learn about them. I really like that. And it's, it's a great way to feel good, give you an opportunity to serve. So I think that's a great, great advice there. So last question, if someone wants to get a hold of you, if they want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, LinkedIn is is definitely the best way. Um, if you just search for me, Amy Omond, um, through LinkedIn, uh, you can shoot me a message there. I love talking about nonprofits and you know thinking about the the FP&A industry as a whole. Um, it's been really fun to be following you, Paul, for the last uh, year um, and learning more from um, other uh, other folks in this space that are publishing great content out on LinkedIn. So, so you can find me there as well. Well, thank you uh, for sharing that. And thank you for joining us, Amy. I really enjoyed this chat and getting to know a little bit about you and being able to talk about not-for-profits. It's not something we get to do a lot on the show. So I really enjoyed it. And thanks again. You have a great day. Thanks. You too. I really appreciate the opportunity. Have a great day. 